Hi, this is Michael Altos, and today we're talking about drugs in the renal system. Just a quick introduction. When we talk about patients who are fluid overloaded, what we mean is that a patient's salt and water intake has exceeded the patient's losses and excretion. Patients can have fluid overload throughout the body or just in one compartment, like in the lungs. Edema, as we've talked about in physiology, is when fluid moves from the vasculature into some interstitial space, and you can have pulmonary edema, or you can have peripheral edema. Patients may also go into congestive heart failure, renal failure, cirrhosis, lots of different things that lead to patients being fluid overloaded. Ideally, we would just treat this with fluid restriction, or even better, prevent it, but sometimes diuresis is needed in order to remove excess fluid from the body. A very quick review of renal anatomy and physiology we know that blood flows into the kidneys through the renal arteries. These arteries divide and divide again until we get to the individual nephron. Here we see renal arterial blood flow coming into the nephron. When the blood comes in, it goes into the glomerulus. And these capillaries are in contact with the renal tubule. Substances, including water and electrolytes, can be filtered into the renal tubule. And then some of them may be reabsorbed out at various points along the length of the renal tubule. So here we see the nephron. And then finally, the nephron will drain into collecting ducts and go to the urine, whereas the blood flow that went into the glomerulus comes out the other side as venous blood, which eventually drains into the renal vein. Again, just a reminder, Sodium mostly is reabsorbed isotonically, which means that when sodium moves, water follows the sodium. To emphasize this point, we can talk about a FINA. FINA stands for fractional excretion of sodium, which says of all the sodium that you have, what percentage of it actually goes out through the urine? Because we know that pretty much all your sodium is filtered into the glomerulus, but less than 1% of it actually leaves through the urine. So your body is very good at retaining sodium. And as the sodium is retained throughout the renal tubule, water follows it. So that's how diuretics are going to work, is primarily by blocking the movement of sodium, and thereby blocking the reabsorption of water as well. Because if, um, if, the, di if the sodium is blocked, then the sodium goes out in the urine and the water does as well. Now this means that if diuretic can't get into the renal tubule, for example, if someone has renal failure, it can't work. And so we're going to have to keep that in mind when we talk about using diuretics. The first diuretic we're going to discuss is a little bit different than all the others. It's acetazolamide, also called diamox. And to understand this, we need to review some renal physiology for a moment. We know that at the glomerulus, sodium and bicarbonate are both freely filtered into the renal tubule. So here's the tubular side of the renal cells, and this would be heading out towards urine. Now, we don't want to lose all of that bicarbonate. We also don't want to lose the water. So what your body does is it has a sodium hydrogen pump. The sodium is retrieved back into the cells. Hydrogen ion is pumped out. This saves water because water follows the sodium. And the hydrogen ion can then mix with the bicarbonate to make carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is then converted into CO2 and H2O through the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. The CO2 can go back into the cells. And that is how the system normally works. Suppose we inhibit carbonic anhydrase. Well, if we inhibit carbonic anhydrase, this whole system starts to back up. As the system backs up, we now have an excess of hydrogen ion. This reverses the direction of our sodium hydrogen pump. Hydrogen is retained, sodium is kept in the renal tubular lumen, and sodium is excreted. When the sodium is excreted, water follows it, and we have diuresis. We also start to lose a lot of bicarb, as a result of inhibiting carbonic anhydrase. So what do we see? Patients have a diuresis, they have alkaline urine, and they develop what we call a hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. So when would we use something like acetazolamide? Well, in the uncommon situation where patients have severe alkalosis, this would be a good way to get rid of excess alkaline and become more acidotic. It's also used in the treatment of altitude sickness and sometimes as a diuretic for patients in heart failure.
We also see acetazolamide being used in treatment of a variety of different conditions like glaucoma, epilepsy, pseudotumor cerebri, and central sleep apnea. The central sleep apnea may be because it makes people more acidotic and may stimulate breathing. And the CSF formation and aqueous humor formation is actually decreased by acetazolamide. So that may help with glaucoma and the pseudotumor cerebri. It's said that there can be some cross sensitivity with sulfa allergy and acetazolamide. The other unusual diuretic that we'll discuss here is mannitol. Mannitol is an osmotic diuretic. It is freely filtered into the renal tubule and poorly absorbed. So once it enters into the renal tubule, because it's osmotic, it will draw water into the renal tubule and keep it there. So it limits the passive water reabsorption that normally follows sodium, and it increases osmolarity of the renal tubule. Mannitol has another effect, which is that it draws water from cells into the plasma. So right now we're talking about what mannitol does before it gets to the kidneys, while it's still in the intravascular space. So it draws water into the plasma. It increases renal blood flow by increasing intravascular volume. So we see an interesting thing with this diuretic, that originally, initially we see a transient fluid overload. You could even get pulmonary edema, and because it's pulling free water, we can see a dilutional hyponatremia. Then, once the diuretic effect starts to take place, and we lose free water, we'll start to see hypernatremia. And you may even see hyperkalemia with higher doses of mannitol. Now, there is some thought that mannitol may confer renal protection in cases of renal ischemia. There really isn't any data to support this, and so we reject the idea that mannitol is renal protective. There's one exception, which is in the case of renal transplant. We do use mannitol in renal transplants, and there may be some benefit to protecting the newly transplanted kidney with mannitol. The place you're more li most likely to see mannitol being used is in neurosurgery. Mannitol is used to decrease intracranial pressure and cerebral blood volume. It's also used to decrease intraocular pressure. Normal serum osmolarity, as we know, is a little bit below 300. With mannitol, we can get osmolarity up into the 300 to 320 range, even up to 330 if necessary. This will increase plasma osmolarity and, again, pull free water out of cells, especially brain cells, in order to relieve intracranial pressure. Now, when you use mannitol, you need to be careful to put it into a good, reliable peripheral IV, if not a central line, because if it extravasates and goes into the tissue, it can cause a very significant tissue injury as it pulls water into that interstitial space. Patients can even develop a compartment syndrome and require fasciotomy. Mannitol is contraindicated in patients who have end-stage renal disease or severe congestive heart failure. If kidney function is compromised, you should use mannitol carefully consider starting with lower doses or checking their serum osmolarity or their osmolar gap. The osmolar gap is calculated by measuring the serum osmolarity, which is a normal lab test, and then subtracting from it the osmolarity due to the most common osmolar substances in the blood, sodium, the blood urea, nitrogen, and glucose. If the osmolar gap is already high, like more than 20, it may be inappropriate to give more mannitol and at that point, you would consider reducing your next dose or delaying it or switching to another substance like hypertonic saline. In normal patients, our dose of mannitol is somewhere between 0.25 to 1 gram per kilogram. I would recommend giving it over at least 15 minutes, and at higher doses, giving it over 30 to 60 minutes would be reasonable. And we should use ideal body weight or adjusted body weight in calculating these doses. I think we'll stop here and continue with the rest of the diuretics in the next lecture. Please contact me if you have any questions.